But the more I'm functioning properly is when I'm active, I'm moving around, I'm walking, I'm golfing, I'm uh, just immersed in day-to-day -day life. Um, that's when I feel the best. I don't know if I'll ever run again unless I'm being chased. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there, my name is Dan Murphy, and you're listening to the Don't Change Much podcast. Not every athlete gets to go out on their own terms, and that's definitely the case with Hockey Hall of Famer Chris Pronger. It wasn't that he was forced to retire because his play dipped. It was because he suffered two major injuries in a short span, and just like that, he was done. In this episode, we talked to Chris about the depression that followed, the long road to getting back to just enjoying quality of life, and the importance of setting your own goals and pace to try to get to a good place again. Well, pleased to uh, welcome in someone I've known for 30 plus years, a good friend of mine, Chris Pronger. He's not nearly as mean as he used to be, as non-playing days now. Uh, so Chris, welcome. And let's just say what keeps you busy and active these days? Trying to eat right. Uh, work out as much as my body will permit and uh, just keep my mind active working on uh, our travel business investments uh, new business opportunities that uh, that come to the forefront and kind of running things down and making sure that it's a good fit for for me and my family uh, you know if it's a good opportunity we'll certainly look at it and spend the time to to kind of dig through it but uh Keeps my mind as sharp as it still is, maybe, and uh, and then obviously work on my body. After 16 surgeries, I've got uh, a little bit of scar tissue built up, so I got to keep uh, motions lotion. Well, we're going to get to how you got to this place. We're in a good spot now. Quality of life is good. Uh, you know, physically and mentally, you're happy. But it wasn't that way, and we're going to go back to the the genesis of it in 2011. Um, it started with a stick to the eye uh, against the Leafs. I think you were bedridden for a few days after that. I was bedridden for eight days, I believe. Then two days after that, you felt the need to start playing again. Was that too soon? <laughs> oh, way too soon. Yeah, I think I was still in the uh, old school mentality of push through and, you know, I'm getting paid to play, so I need to play and I wanted to play. Um, you know, that kind of been ingrained in me from a young age to just, you know, playing the game. I love to play the game. I wanted to play the game. So therefore I was going to push through, uh, no matter what was affecting me or how I felt. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of telltale signs as you look back at them and armchair quarterback it, you know, I was getting very nauseous at practice. I had headaches. Uh, you know, my, my vision was a little bit blurry, but I think that was, the reason for the headaches and, and partly and, and didn't feel great, you know, but I used the, well, I've been bedridden for eight days. So, uh, you know, there's going to, you know, your, your body composition and, and the way that you feel is going to be a little bit off. Uh, so I made a lot of excuses and, you know, tried to, to come back and play and, and felt the first game back was a snoozer. <laughs> that was the one against Tampa where I just stood there with the puck and begged them to come where they were playing the one, three, one. And so, you know, that, that really didn't give me much uh, in the way of getting my heart rate up, uh, but still did not feel great after that game and, and complained a little bit of just feeling nauseous and not not feeling right. You know, I used to have re a really good sixth sense and, and have a good understanding of my surroundings and, and what was going on around me and and could just feel and sense somebody was close. And I had none of that. Uh, and then we went to Florida, played, uh, we had a couple days off, then we played in Florida, then we went to Carolina, and, and I slid on a two-on-one in Carolina, and my feet hit the boards, and I snapped my head back, and that jarred me again. Uh, then we went uh, back home and played Phoenix. I got hit from behind uh, late in that game and, and didn't feel great, let's say. Uh, and then, uh, then we went up to Winnipeg with, you know, I think, I think this was their, f might've been their second year, but I think it was their first and it was super loud, crazy atmosphere and really was really starting to struggle. 
Uh, you know, equilibrium was now off, you know, headaches, nausea, really bad nausea, and not feeling myself at all. And uh, there were a couple instances in that game where I was just like, wow. As I sat back after the game, I was in the penalty box. I came out and knew Tanner Glass was right here. I knew he was there, but I just grabbed the puck and I just kind of turned right into him like he could have killed me killed me and uh thankfully i had a reputation so he didn't he didn't hit me uh and i think he decided to maybe go for a change and that was one instance and then another one i went to take a one-timer and i fell down i missed the puck and fell down uh that was a a a little bit of a wake-up call in and of itself and then uh you know just after that game i think knowing what could have happened putting myself at risk uh, not feeling good, headaches, nausea, all the rest of it, uh, and not able to function at full capacity in a sport where you need to have all your faculties about you. Um, you know, I think after that, I said, "All right, I got to go see somebody. This is I'm not good. I'm not well." And it took the sound, it took a while. Yeah, but it sounds like you knew in those games you were playing already. You were just making excuses to yourself or give yourself a reason to play. Absolutely. You know, it was like, "All right, it'll get better. I'm out of shape." Let me work through it. Let me get back into shape. Let me push through this. You know, the symptoms, you know, I'd had concussions before and the symptoms would always go away. Um, And, you know, this one, they weren't. And and it was actually only exacerbating the situation and making it worse and worse until it was just too much and I couldn't deal with it anymore. How long from that point until it got really bad? Well, I, you know, I think a lot of it was being masked and, and you know, you're, you're, you got your adrenaline going and you're kind of amping up for games and, and trying to get things right in your own head to be able to at least try to play uh, a physical sport in a game that's played at a high speed on ice with blades on your feet. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think the adrenaline was pumping so much that I kind of masked a lot of the um, issues that I was dealing with. And then, you know, once I... Saw the docs the next day. We got back to St. Lu- or back to Philadelphia. Saw the docs. She was like, "All right, you need to go to Pittsburgh and see Mickey Collins uh, and his team, and, and kind of get a full workup." And when I got to Pittsburgh and started talking to Mickey, and you know, you fill out all this paperwork, you you walk through everything that you've been dealing with. He's kind of looking at me, going, "How are you playing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Why do you need to do this?" And I was just like. Well, I don't, but it's what I've done my whole life, and I love playing the game. And he's, like, walking me through all the different issues. I mean, it was, like, just a laundry list of things. More on the, you know, mental side. It wasn't even touching on the physical side of bad back, bad knee, bad this, bad that. It was just, all right, here's your cognitive functioning and and how slow you're reacting to things right now based on your baseline from a couple years ago when you did the baseline testing with the league. And and as he walked through all that stuff, and then he walked through my history and walked through how many years I played and walked through all my injuries, and, you know, you start doing a deep dive into all that stuff. And, and he basically looked at me. He's like, listen, you're you're going to be a mess. If you don't stop playing right now, you're go- you're going to be a mess. Like, you still have time to get things right, but you've got so much wrong with you right now with respect to – my vestibular system, which was in part my eye and the concussion, uh, you know, obviously concussion symptoms, and then, you know, on and on and on. It was, uh, you know, as he walked through that laundry list, you're just kind of like, oh, this is a little bit more serious than I initially thought it was going to be. And, and you have to kind of take a step back and go, okay, I'm 38 years old. I've accomplished a lot in the game. Do I really need to, to do this? And, and more importantly, how long is it going to take for me to get healthy again? And, you know, as we know, it took like a year and a half, two years. When you left that, were you still like, all right, this guy doesn't know me. I think I can still get back to playing. Or were you serious? Like, I think this might be done because, you know. No, but by by that point, by that point, I had already done a bunch of research. I'd already seen a couple doctors and, and, and him being the foremost expert uh, at the time. um, I had pretty well come to the conclusion that something seriously was wrong uh you know with the headaches like i was driving to 
functions at night wearing sunglasses because the, the oncoming car lights were bothering me and giving me headaches and, and making me my equilibrium off and, and driving a car. That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> so how long from that point until you were in, I think you described it as a real dark, dark place. Yeah. So I went from there, started doing some therapy stuff, started, you know, and then for a while I, I didn't see an eye doc, so I didn't have glasses. So my eye was blurry and I, you know, I'd go home and I'd start reading a book and I'd start doing stuff and read, you know, reading the book, your eyes constantly trying to clear itself and, and, and unblur itself. And that was giving me headaches, but I wasn't, I didn't know that was giving me headaches. So then I went back to see Mickey Collins uh, and I saw a, his eye specialist and then he said, oh, no, your eye is blurry and you, here, you gotta wear these. They originally wanted me to wear contacts and I'm like, I can't put my finger in my eye. Uh, and so I had to wear glasses and therefore, like, well, I'm not going to play with glasses on. And I think as you start walking through the steps and going, okay, what's it going to take to reach this hurdle? What's it going to take to reach this hurdle? And you just start looking at it and start trying to figure out, mapping out my eye. And, and then I started doing the vestibular exercises. And it was um, it was daunting. You know, it was really, as I was doing the vestibular exercises and working on my eye, it was really flaring up my, my concussion symptoms. So it was kind of a, you got to fix this first before we can deal with that. I had to get my eyes right, which was basically retraining my brain to see properly. And then from that, I could then tackle the, the concussion issues and, and other things. So there was a, a pretty big process ahead of me in, in trying to deal with my eye and then the concussion and, and things like that. So I really didn't have a timetable at that point. I think one of the nice things was I had a, a meeting with Mr. Snyder and uh, and his uh, son-in-law was a, a doctor that he used to run stuff by, and and he looked at my file and he's just like, "How's this guy playing?" And you know went through the whole thing, and 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 I think that gave me more peace of mind that Mr. Snyder was was good with it and understood kind of what I was dealing with, and um, you know when you have the owner kind of have your back like that, it it, it makes it a lot easier. How tough was it on your family? You had young kids. You said that, uh, not that yeah, you're abusive, but you were, came close to striking them a couple of times because you're scared. They <laughs> snuck up on you. <laughs> you know, like again, because I used to have a really good sixth sense, I'd know they were kind of lurking around the corner. I knew they were, they were around me. And I had not, I, I still, I mean, not very well or, or not very good. Coming around a corner, I get startled all the time. Whereas before, I kind of, you, you brace yourself. You can get a feeling that the energy or whatever, you can see, you know somebody's around the corner. I mean, they'd scare me, not on, not necessarily on purpose sometimes. They're kids. And, you know, a couple of times you're just startled and you're like, don't do that. <laughs> you know, almost like it's a robber or somebody in your house. And you're like, what's going on? So, you know, there's a few times where I was startled and just you kind of get taken aback. Or, you know, loud noises used to really bother me. So, they're you know, they're kids. They're screaming and yelling to have a good time and doing whatever. And, uh, you know, that used to really aggravate me and, and get under my skin. Um, you know, camera flashes. So I would take, you know, you go to take pictures at an event. I'm like, you can't use your flash. Um, you know, it still bothers me a, a fair amount to, to this day. Um, you know, just light sensitivity and, and, you know, the things that you hear a lot of people that are dealing with this, uh, you know, struggle with on a day-to-day basis. And so for me, it was tackling each and every one and then understanding what I was dealing with and, and then how to fix it or at least manage it in a way that, uh, that wouldn't allow me to flare up. How was your mental health at this point? Cause you're not only dealing with <clears throat> the symptoms uh, physically, but you're also dealing with uh, the reality that your career is done. Yeah. I think, you know, career's over on the outside looking in, just looking at me, I look fine. I look normal. You know, like it's not like you got a broken arm and you're out two to three weeks and, uh, or you got a broken leg, you're out six weeks or a month or, you know, whatever. You know, there's no set timeline for this type of injury. And I think that's the, the hardest part for a lot of players when this happens is there's no set amount of time. Everybody heals differently. Everybody handles it differently. Everybody can manage or control symptoms in, in their own way. And, and so it, it's very, 
it's not cut and dry. So for me, you know, it was frustrating that I, I couldn't play. It was frustrating that everybody's asking me, hey, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? When are you coming back? And I'm like, I can't just go out and say I'm not. I'm just saying, hey, I'm working on it. And, you know, so it just, you know, and then you get into the, the locker room and, and you're around the team and it's like, hey, man, you look good. Hey, when are you coming back? Hey, we miss you. And, and all that, that, you know, and then you're watching the games and it's like, well, that wouldn't happen if I was there. And, and, you know, you start playing all the guessing games as it relates to, to playing the sport that you love. And, and so it, it can be frustrating and, and, and draining. And, uh, you know, I, you get depressed and then you start eating bad and then you start working out less. And it's just, you know, it's a trickle down effect and, and it brings you into a dark hole and a dark space that, uh, is hard to get out of. How long did it take you to get out of it? And what got you out of it? Was there someone, was there just a reality in your head saying, this is not good enough. I have to be better. Or what helped you through this, this time and how long did it take? Yeah, I think it was probably, you know, six or seven months. I gained a bit of weight. Uh, I think I was, I was playing that year. I think I was 220 and I might've gotten up to 240, a little bit of a pot belly. And I'm like, all right, this is, you know, you, you can only blame so many things for your problems. And I'm like, listen, start doing the things that are going to help you eat right, work out, do all the things that you used to do, maybe on a more muted level and and have an understanding of what flares you up. Don't do it. Uh, or or and, and, and as I was going through this, the medical field kind of changed their thinking in how you went about it for a long time. It was like, don't do anything and sit in a dark room. Don't flare up and your symptoms will go away. And then it became, well, get out in the light, you know, get the, get to the, get to the level where you flare up and then come back below that and try to keep pushing that up and up and up. And so there was a little bit of counter advice, but, but at the end of the day, you got to do what works for you and what uh, allows you to continue to have progress you know, there was always like, hey, do you want to go see this doctor? Hey, do you want to go see that doctor? And I was like, no, I, I don't want to go from one to another to another because then you never know what's what's going to work. If you just stick to one and stick to what you're doing and you see a little bit of progress, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and you just got to keep working on it. Um, you know, I think some people look for a quick fix. And, and unfortunately, with the brain and with the body, there is no quick fix. Sometimes it's it's time. It's time under tension, and, and it's the ability to kind of keep pushing yourself, uh, much like we used to, you know, much like you do when you're training and playing and things like that. The same ideology uh, is, is right here on this as well. So it's about six to eight months when you get out of the depressed state, you start to exercise more, eat right. Did you notice immediately uh, improvement in mental health? Uh, or was there still barriers you had to get through uh, physically? Like the quality of life was obviously not there at that point. Yeah, you know, I was still flaring up, but but I was starting to see, you know, I'm now six six months into my vestibular rehab as we then finally diagnose the issue, start working on it, you know, starting from ground zero and then building it back up. And so, you know, it's just, it's a time thing. It just, takes time and it takes repetitions and it takes uh, you having the ability to continue to do the work and then layer on top of layer on top of layer and, and build it back up. And so I think for a lot of people, that's the biggest part is they want to, they want a mountain instead of just a slow rolling hill. And, and it just, it, it takes time and some people get frustrated and then they stop and they're like, Oh, it's not working. It is working. You just can't see the day-to-day -day progress. But if you were to look at two months ago to now, there, it might be this much. It might be this much. You, you just have to be able to have metrics to track it so that you can understand and see the gains that you are making. And even if they're small, you're not going, at least you're not going the other direction, which, which sometimes happens. So you have to really kind of stick with it and, and, and continue to push yourself, stay positive in a, in a, in a situation where it's easy to go negative and we all do it. And, and, you know, it's never every, you know, you're going to have bad days and it, it's getting out of those bad days. 
and having having things that can you know bring positivity and whether it's working out and getting an endorphin rush or uh, eating right instead of bailing and having a bunch of junk food eat eat quality food um, you know and then you go down the drugs and alcohol slope and 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 guys can get lost in that so it's you have to really be focused and and have an understanding of what the metrics are that you're tracking and then and then stick to it could you stay positive <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult uh yeah there uh, moments yeah i mean we all struggle we're all human but i think for me it was i would get frustrated watching the team you know then the team started struggling then it's like well again i go back if i was there that wouldn't happen and we sign a goalie and then i'm like that guy wouldn't be doing that if i was there and you just start thinking not negative thoughts but negativity creeps in and then it's like well i'm not there i mean and you start going down that rabbit hole and it's a matter of kind of extracting yourself and i was getting to an age then i was 39 and i was like by the time i got to 40 i was like well i'm done first in my finally in my head i'm like i was watching games like that wouldn't happen if i was playing or i'm watching games why did he do that he should have did this and then i got to 40 and i'm like well i'm done you know, with all the surgeries I've had and my body and everything, I'm like, physically I'm done. And mentally now I'm starting to get better and healthy. And I'm like, I'm done. Like I, I couldn't play even if I tried for a number of reasons. And so then I started watching the game differently and just more as a fan and more as, you know, a scout and outsider looking in and just kind of looking at the game as, is a player progressing? Is he developing? Is he getting better? Uh, and, and things of that nature. And then that allowed me to kind of get out of the the one mindset where, where it would bring a negativity and where I thought I had a way to impart uh, my presence or my knowledge or play on the situation. And then that, let that uh, kind of fall into the next part where I'm just a quasi fan watching the game, not picking it apart as a player, but just more as a fan. And that allowed me to kind of get out of my head. Was there a time, even momentarily in those kind of two years from the injury to this point where you're like, I'm done, that you in the back of your head said, ah, maybe there's a chance. And did you ever feel like you're were, you were letting your teammates down? Oh, absolutely. You know, and that's part of the, that that's what drives you into depression is, you know, you, you play a team sport. It's all about the team. It's every, every man needs to come together and, and, and be one and be a team and, and do things for one another. And, and when you're not there, that's, you know, when you listen to guys that have played, that that's one of the things that they miss the most is the camaraderie, the locker room, being together, having sharing a common goal and common belief that you can win and then going out and executing and doing it. And, you know, you miss that. That's one of the things you miss the most. And so, yeah, do you feel like you're letting them down? Absolutely. You know, there's always the, the little birdie in the back of your brain going, you can get there and and you got to have a goal you got to have a mission and you got to you know have something that's driving you to get healthy yeah maybe you never know i mean who knows but that certainly was a was a remote <laughs> very remote chance you know and then you get to you know like i said i get to 40 and i'm like no way couldn't do it we'll get to present day now and exercise and and how you're doing but it's it's kind of weird that when these injuries initially happened, the stick to the eye, the hit from behind that you kept playing because you had that moment in Detroit in the playoffs years before where, and you can explain it, but you, know, you got hit in the chest, the puck, and that really startled you. That scared you to the point where you were relying on doctors, can I come back? And yet later on, <clears throat> you're still relying on yourself to say, I can come back. So uh, why were those two instances different in your mind? Yeah, I think, you know, I had the same thing that happened to DeMar Hamlin. So I had you know, what's known as commotio cortis. I got hit in the heart right before my heart beat. I skipped a beat. Uh, as, as I've now come to realize, I stopped breathing. Um, in my head, I cover the puck. I'm like, okay, get up. I knew where the bench was. I blacked out at that point, but in the video, you can see I get up, kind of stumble, go to the ice. And the next thing you know, I wake up and I'm staring up at the Red Wings banners and, you know, all the lore and history in Joe Louis Arena, wondering what's going on. And I kind of glance over to my right and I can see our bench and you get guys crying over there. 
And as I talked to our trainer, Ray Borelli, I'm like, so what, what was going on? He's like, actually, we were panicking because at that time, they didn't have defibrillators on the ice or in the building. Uh, he was getting ready to do mouth to mouth and, and was about to hit my chest to try to kickstart my heart. And then I just took a deep breath and I just all of a sudden kind of came to and started breathing, breathing again and my heart started going. So it was a pretty scary situation. And, and uh, But again, going back to, to your point about, well, why did you come back and play? It's all, it's all you know is, well, I've, I'm alive. I can play. Like uh, I sat and talked to the, to the heart specialist here in St. Louis for probably 20 hours just asking questions. By the time I got back here, did some testing, wore the heart monitor, came back the next day, looked at the monitor, did more testing, talked to her about what happened, what was it, why did it happen, would it happen again, you know, it happens more frequently in Little League and, and, and in younger people. But to think 25 years ago, the next time it would happen on in a major sport was that incident. That's crazy to think, a 25-year span between uh, the two. And luckily, you know, for me, it wasn't on, there was no social media, very little coverage in the, in the media. Um, and so I think it kind of flew under the radar. And, and just having an understanding of how infrequently it happens and, and the timing and the number of things that have to happen before you get hit for that to actually happen, it's like winning the lottery. That's, the odds are, are massive. So, you know, having that understanding and then, you know, just asking the questions of, is, are there any short-term side effects or long-term side effects what happens if somebody body checks me? What happens if, you know, on and on and on? All the what ifs that people are probably thinking, you're asking all these questions. She's obviously imparting some wisdom on the heart and kind of the body and, 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 and the chemistry and how everything's made up and, and what may or may not happen. Uh, but, you know, listening to her and listening to the doctors and, and, you know, some literature that I was given, I mean, into... Maybe, you know what, I, mean, honestly, I probably would play today too. <laughs> like, um, once they tell you that you're fine and once you walk through um, everything that, that transpired and, 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 and the reasons behind it and the sequencing of events and the timing and, and on and on, I mean, what are the chances of that happening a second time? Pretty slim. So I'm like, well... I'm here. <laughs> I went down to the rink and, you know, met with the coaching staff, you know, saw the guys and was like, wow, well, I'm here. I'm, I'm physically cleared. It, at this stage, it's more of a mental hurdle. Like, are you going to be gun shy? Are you, how, how are you going to do in the game? And, you know, are you, are you, are you potentially leaving yourself susceptible to, to getting injured because you're nervous or leery or uncomfortable playing the game again? So, I took a warm up, felt fine, and was like, "Well, I'm here. Let's. I might as well rip the bandaid off and get after it again, uh, and and see how I do." So it was, uh, you know, it was a rush of adrenaline going on to the ice for that game. That's for sure. And and uh, you know, I think just for for me, and I think for a lot of athletes, just ripping the bandaid off and seeing if you can do it, um, and get an understanding. Not let it letting that moment linger too long and and potentially giving you you know some some mental hurdles you're going to need to jump over if that goes on for you know had we lost I think we I think we won that game I think we lost in five that series so maybe we had a couple more games and then we we're done had I not played and then I got to sit all summer and wonder can I play can I not play I mean I, I got into the game and you know, I was you got butterflies going. You're a little bit nervous, but you're always nervous for a game. Um, I don't know if I was more nervous, but uh, once you get immersed in the game, you get hit a couple of times, you get the emotions going, the adrenaline going, uh, you know, it, it kind of, that feeling kind of went away, which was, which was good for me just to get it over with and, and get back into doing something that I love. So what role does exercise play in your life today? And how important is it to you? It's very important. You know, I think I try to work out 
try to lift three to four times a week, do cardio a couple times a week, uh, eat right. You know, a lot of it is diet, as we all know, and and what you put into your body. And then it's, for me, with my various injuries and <laughs> and maladies, um, you know, I just need to keep moving. Motion's lotion. If I'm sitting around, uh, you know, there's times when you're traveling or times when you're doing stuff and you're just sitting around a lot. That that's where my body stiffens up. It starts to you know tighten up and you know, get back issues and uh, you know things of that nature. Hip flexors and you know knees get sore. Uh, but the more I'm functioning properly is when I'm active. I'm moving around. I'm walking. I'm golfing. I'm uh, just immersed in day to day life. Um, that's when I feel the best. It sounds like if you don't do that, and if you are uh, stationary, uh, sedentary, then that could probably affect your mental health because you're not feeling as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 it does. When you're sitting around, you're feeling a. You got a lot of time on your hands. More importantly, with mentally thinking to yourself, thinking deep thoughts, thinking about X, Y, Z, uh, and if you're working out, you're going to have more positive thoughts. You got your endorphins going. You got all these things from a positive standpoint, working in your favor, uh, which is another reason why I try to do something every day, try to get moving, try to be active, uh, just to kind of clear your head. You know, the more you get your blood flow moving, the better you're going to feel, uh, the better thoughts you're going to have, uh, the deeper thoughts you're going to have in, in a positive manner. Um, so for me, just being active, you know, getting out there, doing stuff, it, uh, it's a big part of my day. You were lucky enough to have access to all the, the best doctors, obviously, given you know who you were and the teams you played with. But what about someone off the street who's suffered a career engine injury at work, you know, you know, construction site or something, um, or is just not feeling right? How proactive should, should someone be in seeking out help and seeking out doctors and not just sitting on something? Well, I think you, number one, you got to be proactive. You know, look at how my career ending situation happened i i prolonged it and delayed it myself because i was had my head in the sand and didn't want to deal with what i was dealing with until ultimately i had to and so you know i think you have to be proactive i think you have to take the bull by the horns and and eat right be physically active that doesn't mean you got to go spend money in the gym you go for a walk get some fresh air get out of your house apartment whatever and Go for a walk. Get the fresh air. The fresh air on your face is going to allow you to sunlight, air. Uh, it, it keeps your mind clean and clear. And uh, if anything, that's the simplest form, getting outside and going for a walk. If you're starting to feel like you're getting in your own head and you're having deep, dark thoughts, get outside, get some fresh air Take the shades off, feel it, and and that's helped me a great deal. Just being outside, going for a walk, walking my dogs. It's not like it's you know incredibly taxing, uh, but it's just you're getting fresh air, going for a walk, you know, hanging out with the dogs, whatever, whatever you like to do. Um, you know, I think it's incredibly important. You talk to doctors about your physical health. Did you ever have to talk to doctors about your mental health? Yeah, there's a few times where, you know, you know, there's always, you know, do you want to hurt yourself? Do you want to, you know, I never got to that, that darkness. You know, there's lots of times you just, you're in that dark hole and you're like, I just don't feel like doing anything. And, you know, you just, and the more you do that, the deeper down you go until you get to that point. I never got to that point because you, know, you start feeling like that. And, you know, luckily I got a good wife. I got three, three good kids, beautiful kids. You know, and they kind of help drag you up and they can see you kind of slinkering away into the dark room or slinkering away over here, getting away from everybody. And they drag you back in, come outside, go for a walk. Um, you know, you know, they, they've been a, a big, a big part of it. How's your quality of life now? It's pretty good. Um, just had my right knee replaced about 16 months ago and it's finally getting over the hump uh, where I can pretty much do anything, which is good. Um, you know, again, and I think it feels better. The more I use it, it feel the better it feels, you know, going for walks, riding the bike a little bit, uh, golfing, 
you know, doing everything that I would normally do. You know, I was never a big runner. I'm not going to be a big runner. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever run again unless I'm being chased. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to to get back to your the things that are you're passionate about and the things that you want to do and have wanted to do, whether it's your injuries are slowing you down and not allowing you to or – uh, you know, your mental acuity and clarity is, is foggy. You get out, get moving. That'll help unfog you and, and, and give you that, the clear mindset that, that there is a, a, a better day ahead and it's a matter of going and finding it. Eyesight's okay. What about hearing? Are you still sensitive to sound? <laughs> hearing Do you still wear the white noise hear? earbuds? Um, <laughs> yeah, eyesight's good. You know, I think every year... I think it's partly age now where every year I got to get a little bit stronger glasses. Um, you know, loud sounds still bother me. More so when the sounds are behind me. If there's a loud sound in front of me, I'm fine. But, but, but when, when there's a loud noise behind me, it's not good. Uh, it still startles me and you know, it might trigger me a little bit. But um, you know, overall, you know, I would say I'm as good as I'm going to get. And, and I think that's where... I might not ever get to where I was, but where I am now is so much further away and, and better than where I was. And I think you, you have to have notches, lines, goals, whatever, whatever you want to call them. And, and once you hit those hurdles, make sure you don't revert back. Stay here. Always just continually set another notch up. Everything's always moving in the right direction. And as you keep doing that, you know, whether it's, you know, let's say you were a runner, you know, you're go walking, slow walk, you know, quick, quick walking, jogging, speed jogging, and then you're running. And it just constantly having the, the little hurdles that you can accomplish. So you feel good about yourself. You accomplish something. You can't set the goal so high that you're never going to accomplish it. And therefore you feel terrible because you're not reaching your goals. You got to set them so you can achieve them, check them off the list and then keep going. I think there's a good time for this question because I think it, you kind of answered it there, but what does, you know, the, the title of this podcast is don't change much. So uh, when you're trying to get better mentally and physically, what does don't change much mean to you? Well, I think it's, it's a matter of small increments in the right direction. Don't change much. If, if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And, and therefore, if you're seeing improvement, stick with it. Don't change much. You know, you might add an exercise. You might add one little thing that to see if that improves, but it's a metric that you can now track because it's something small. You're not going completely outside uh, whatever you're doing and then going, okay, which one worked? Because you're seeing a little bit of improvement, you do this over here. Is that why it's better or is it just because of the little improvements that you were making? And so I... I I thoroughly believe and don't change much. I mean, it, it's a matter of slow, steady progress, you know, the, the tortoise and the hare, whatever analogy you want to use. Slow, steady progress is going to get you to where you want to go. There is no quick fix, especially in this. It's slow, steady progress. Progress makes perfection, but it's a matter of getting getting there and it, and it takes time. And unfortunately for a lot of people, they don't understand that and, and they get bogged down in, oh, well, so-and-so is already doing this and I should. Everybody's different. Everybody's running at their own speed, at their own pace, uh, and healing at, 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 their own, at their own speed and own pace. So it's a matter of, of understanding that and, and set your own uh, hurdles, goals, guidelines, whatever you want to call them, not based on somebody else, but based on yourself. Well, Chris, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast today, uh, sharing your stories. Uh, we hope that there's parallels that uh, people that weren't professional athletes uh, can take from this and incorporate their own lives to try to get better. So uh, we hope you're feeling better, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in person yes. fairly soon. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can access more information at menshealthfoundation.ca. And if you haven't already, click the follow button to join us every month for a new episode of the Don't Change Much podcast.